strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Our song for tonight is I am so grateful that God never gave up on us. Your word will make a difference. 
It's in Jesus' name we pray and we ask it all. Amen. And thank God. I am God never gave up on us. We are not give up on you. Amen. Bless the name of Jesus the Christ. Good to see everybody out again tonight at Bible study. We're in the book called Experiencing God, Knowing and Doing God's Will. Henry Blackaby is the divisionary author, Knowing and Doing God's Will, Experiencing God. Let me just say to you, if you do not have a book, get with me afterwards. I can give you some of my notes um, so you can prepare for next week. This week we are looking at Unit 1, Day 1. Unit 1, Day 1, and we will not complete Day 1 every Wednesday night. So you'll have time to read up on day one and day two by next week, amen? Just know that the handout is my notes. You ought to have your notes, amen? amen. The handouts are my notes, and some of them are Sister Whitlock notes, so uh, you ought to have your notes, and I'm gleaming from her notes and my notes, amen? I want to get some volunteers to stand and read just where you are. Volunteer for John 17, 3, uh, John 15, 5, and John 10, 10. John 17, 3, Sister Irvin. John 17, 3. Speak with your outside voice for me. And this is, the, and this is the eternal life, that men may know you, the only true God, and that men can know Jesus Christ, Amen. The one you sent. Amen. So, so God wants us to, to, to know him, and Jesus wants us to know God, but the only way for us to know God is through Jesus Christ, yes? Amen. So God wants us to know him. The first day, God, the unit is God's will and your life. The day one, the first day, is Jesus is your way. And you look on page number eight, you'll find Jesus is your way. Um, so this old book pretty much has the same thing. If you all want to share this book and give it back to me, somebody uh, asked you, you want to come get this book for me, and you can share it with Gigi or, or whoever's back there with you. And uh, now I know that you got my book. Amen. Thank you. Amen. 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 So we're looking at God's will in your life. God's will and your life. As you look at your notes, you will hear and see as well as read me saying I, me, my. <clears throat> because I want this study to be made personal to you. Personal to me. This is a personal study. I did this study back in the 90s, and if you're going to get all you can get out of this study, you're going to have to study it before Wednesday night. This study is powerful, it is life-changing, and if you're going to have a transformation in your life, you got to study it before you get here on Wednesday night. You have to study it. You have to look at it. You have to pray about it. That's why if you do not have a book, I want to give you some notes that we will come upon and run into uh, later on. Thank God for those who have purchased books. Day one, Jesus is your way. Who's the way? Jesus. Jesus is the way. Is there any other way? No, he's the only way. Jesus is the only way. Real Christianity or real Christianity is not merely a religion. When we talk about Christianity or Christianity, we're not talking about a mere religion. Religion is a duty in which we perform. Matter of fact, the Bible is clear when it says that real, true, and pure religion is taking care of the orphans and taking care of the widows. Certainly, we ought to take care of the orphan and the widows 
Therefore, we ought to understand that this is our religion. Yes? But when we talk about true Christianity, when we talk about real Christianity, we're not talking about religion. We're talking about a relationship. We're talking about a relationship with a person. We're talking about a relationship with a person, and that person is God himself. So when we talk about Christianity, Christianity is a relationship with a person, and that person is God. That person is God himself. We have a relationship with other people all the time. But when it comes to Christianity, when it comes to walking in the presence of God, we need a relationship with God himself. We need a right, intimate relationship with God. Intimacy, meaning that we ought to be closely intertwined with God, and God is closely intertwined with us. Relationship. Really, he's really talking about a fellowship. We got to fellowship with God. We got to spend time with Him. The reason why we get together and we eat together, we go to the movies together, we we bowl together, we skate together, we go hiking together, is because we're developing the relationship we have with each other. We're developing a relationship. In other words, we're strengthening a fellowship by being in fellowship with one another. So real Christianity is not a mere religion. It is a relationship with a person. And that person is? That person is God. As I, here's that word I, I told you that I've changed some of the wording to make it very personal to us in my notes. Now you can change it in your notes. As I follow Jesus one day at a time, as I follow Jesus one day at a time, we ask God for daily bread, yes? Amen. And since we ask God for daily bread, we want God to give us enough bread for that day. When God gave them manna for one day, they start throwing, they start storing it up like church folk. You ever been to a church where you go in the kitchen and you ask the, the, the kitchen committee or kitchen or culinary ministry, hey, do you have any more of this food? And they'll tell you, no, we don't have any. They got it. <laughs> and then when you walk behind the curtains, you got plates upon plates stacked up back there. I sure did hate to charge this brother off, but I said, man, you got seven plates in a trash bag taking it out, and we got folk who have it. And so God wants us to have that which we will use daily. Yeah, you ought to have stuff stored up at your pantry, but don't take it from the church to fill up your pantry. You ought to have stuff in your deep freezer, but don't take it from the church to fill up your deep freezer. You ought to have stuff for your grandchildren and your neighbors and friends when they come over. But don't take it from the church so you can supply the neighborhood. That's how it is with God. If we're going to walk with God and be intimately involved with him, we got to get with him daily in all the day. We got to get with him daily. As I follow Jesus, how much? One day at a time. Every day is a brand new day. That's why we say that God gives us new mercies every day. You can't take the fact that you woke up this morning and apply it to tomorrow. Because you didn't have to wake up this morning. And you certainly don't have to wake up tomorrow. So God's mercy is new to us every single day. So we want a relationship with God. And as we follow Jesus Christ, one day at a time, he will keep me 
God, he will keep I, who is Mr. He will keep me in the center of God's will. As I walk with God daily, as I follow Jesus Christ one day at a time, Jesus will keep me in the center of God's will. Why y'all didn't catch that? He will keep me in the center of God's will. And let me tell you, we want to be in the center of God's will. Anybody in the room want to be in God's center of God's will? Do you really want to be in God's will? You just want it like you want it when you want it, how you want it. I dare tell you that most Christians want it how they want it, when they want it, the way they want it, they want it right now. They want it that way right now. They want it that way right now. And they want it when they want it. I'm, I'm guilty. And that's why sometimes when you hear preachers pray, especially in, in, in crusades, God bless right now. God deliver right now. Get up out of that wheelchair and walk right now. But it wasn't right then that we got in that position. It was over a process of time. And so if we're going to be blessed of God and in the center of God's will, it may just take a process of time. I didn't get jacked up like this overnight. Matter of fact, I didn't even come here jacked up like this. I messed me up. My environment influenced me. And here I am. Still having to get along with God one day at a time, every day, in order that I can be all that God would have me to be so that I can be in the center of God's will. You ought to want to be in the center of God's will. You ought to desire to be in the center of God's will. That's why Jesus says when we pray, we ought to pray like this. Our Father, God in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. That's straight King James. Thou will, your will be done. Not my will. Then we have the nerve to say, Lord, not my will, but your will be done. But in the back of our hearts, in the back of our minds, God, now you know I really said that, but I really wanted the way I wanted it. But when we walk with Jesus, we follow him one day at a time, he will keep us in the center of God's will. We can't even keep ourselves. It takes Jesus to keep us in the center of God's will. And let me tell you, it doesn't matter who you get mad with, you want to be in the center of God's will. It doesn't matter who rubs you the wrong way. You want to be in the center of God's will. And when you're in the center of God's will, this is eternal life. This is eternal life. And when you have eternal life, we understand that, that God knows us and we know God. This is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God, the one you have sent. And the one you have sent, God, is Jesus the Christ. Remember we talked about the model of prayer in the, in the Lord's Prayer. Which one is and what is the difference? Which one is the model of prayer? Which one is the, the Lord's Prayer? Where are they found in our Bible? Matthew chapter 6. Which one is that? That's the model prayer. Okay, so when we look at Matthew chapter 16, I mean Matthew chapter 6, I'm sorry, Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 through 13, there we find Jesus laying out for his disciples the model prayer. The key here is, it's the model prayer because the disciples ask the question, Lord, 
Will you teach us to pray? Or they ask, Lord, teach us to pray. Lord, will you teach us to pray? Or Lord, teach us to pray. Jesus says, when you pray, you pray like this. When you pray, you pray like this. You pray in this manner. So he gives us the model prayer. The model prayer is you glorify God's name. He says, hallowed to our name. Hallowed. We, we glorify your name. We say hallelujah to you. We glorify you. We worship you. Hallowed to your name. First thing we do. I mean, I got some things that I want to ask him. But before I ask him, I got to glorify. You know, this thing became real to me when I had a daughter and she was about three, four years old and she had already picked up on this thing. My hair was just beginning to recede. My afro was gone for life. And I would work 12 hours on graveyard to drive another hour home. I am tired. I'm laying on the couch and I'm trying to play with her. And I'm in and out of sleep. And she began to rub my ball head and said, Daddy, you're the greatest daddy in the world. She was setting me up. And I didn't even know it. Oh, Daddy, you're the greatest daddy in the world. Now let's go outside. I had built this swing set in the backyard with swings on it. I, I struggled after graveyards getting it built. And once I got it built, I didn't know I was creating a problem for myself. Problem is, I built the swing, now I have to make sure that she uses the swing. It didn't matter to her that I haven't gone 18 hours. It's daylight now. Let's go outside and play. And the way she got it done was, Daddy, you know, you're the greatest daddy in the world. There is no daddy like you. You are wonderful. I don't know even where she get these words from at age three and four. Jesus says when we pray, that's how we ought to begin our prayer. God, we, we glorify you. We say hallowed to your name. God, you are awesome. God, you're the magnificent one. Lord, you are the king of kings. God, you are God and there's none like you. Jesus laying out this small prayer. Then he says, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. God, I know you're the king. And I want your kingdom to come on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, I want the, the atmosphere that exists in heaven to come to planet Earth. He said, this is how you pray. This is the model prayer. He says, the kingdom come. Lord, let your will be done. Now, here we are. We about to ask God to do something, but we asking God first, God, let your will be done. Let your kingdom come. God, you are glorious. You are magnificent. Now let your will be done. Our Father, who is in heaven, thy be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now we ask him for what? Give us this day thy daily bread. Then we ask him to forgive us for our trespasses, or forgive us from our debts, as we forgive our debtors. We go through all these things. Jesus says we go through all three of these things, all four of these things, before we ask God for anything. says, this is your model prayer. And after you have asked him, after you have praised him, then you ask him. After you glorified him, then you ask him. After you told him how hallowed, how magnificent he is, there's no God like him. After you got to that point, then you said, now Lord, give me my daily bread. And while you're at it, Lord, forgive me for messing up and God, I promise you, as you forgive me, I'm going to forgive other folks. That's what Jesus says in that model prayer. He started it off by glorifying God. Then when he gets to the end of it, he said, to thine is the kingdom, to thine is the glory. Amen. For how long? However. Forever. For now. So he gives us this model prayer. But tonight we look at John 17. Primarily verse number three that Sister Irvin read to us. And, and we find out that Jesus is praying this Lord's prayer to secure us 
to stand for us. He comes and he pleads our case. He talks about unity. He talks about the one he has sent. Who has sent? God has sent. Who is he that God has sent? Jesus the Christ, the righteous one. Who has uh, John 15, 5 and John 10, 10? John 15, 5. John 10, 10. Okay, brother. Fifteen and five, John fifteen and five. And then John ten ten. John fifteen and five, I am the vine, you are the branches. Mm -hmm. He who abides in me, and I in him, bears much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. Thank you. So we got we have John fifteen and five. Jesus says that he's the he is the vine, we are the branches. He's talking to saved folk. He's talking to believers. He's talking to his disciples. He says, I am the vine. And let me just tell you, you cannot do anything without the vine. He says, stay connected to the vine. Well, first of all, he's taking care of that because once we're saved, we're connected to the vine. So when we're saved and we're connected to the vine, Jesus says that he's the, he's the vine and his father, God, is the vine dresser. He's the vine keeper. He keeps us and he keeps the vine. As God prunes the vine, he cuts away stuff so new stuff can grow. It's this time of year you see the trees and the bushes. The lawn man comes by and he cuts all the weeds off, all the heads off. I'm waiting on him to come by my house just to cut that tree a little bit for me. All the dead leaves that are on there since the freeze. He prunes them. And then when springtime comes, they blossom again. He says, I'm the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me, and I in him, something great happens. Remain, remain in me. Remain in me. In other words, stay attached to me. Don't just go to heaven any old kind of way. He says, if you remain in me and I in you, then he bears much fruit. Then you bear much fruit. The man, the woman, the boy, the girl who stays in him, who abides in him, who lives in him, who walks in him, you are guaranteed to bear much fruit. You know, people say, don't judge me, don't judge me. I don't have to judge you. I'm just inspecting fruit. I'm just a fruit inspector. You know what I mean? If I see you selling drugs and I call you a drug dealer, I'm not judging you. I just saw you selling drugs. You may quit tomorrow, but today you a drug dealer. And it doesn't matter if it's an ounce or quart, a nickel or a dime. Somebody got it. You a drug. I don't have to judge you. I see what I see. If I call you a cusser, it's because I heard you cussing. And ladies, it's just not cute for women to cuss like that. It's not ladylike. Not even when you're mad. It's just not cute. Men run when women start cussing like seaport sailors. Well, he just made me mad. He's gone, man. Because when you're in the vine and you're attached to the vine, you bear much fruit. And that fruit is love, joy, peace, happiness. How you carry yourself. Abide in, and abide, abide in the vine, and the vine will make sure that you bear much fruit. Then he says, apart from Jesus, you can do nothing. Apart from Jesus, there's absolutely nothing you can do. Oh, yeah, we can do some things, but they won't be fruitful. The lady E.K. Bailey dealt with this, this, this passage in, in uh, 
Psalm 1, and he talks about how the, the righteous man bears fruit and his leaf shall not wither. And then he came back and he said, I see too many Christians that are leafy, but they're not fruitful. They own the mine. They own the tree. The tree planted by the rivers of water. The tree is living, but you leafy and have no fruit. If you abide in him and he abide in you, you will have much fruit. A. I need an intimate love relationship with God. I need to have an intimate love relationship with God. I need a closely knitted relationship with God. See, Adam had a relationship with God that was intimate. It was a love relationship. The Bible teaches that, that God will walk through in the cool of the day. He talks to Adam and Adam talks to him. They had great fellowship. After sin entered into the world, now God and Adam has to do some things to get that fellowship back. Jesus died to bridge the gap between God and man because sin had created a great gulf between the two. But when Jesus died on Calvary, rose from the dead, we accept that story as our salvation story. Now we can get to God and God can get to us. Jesus bridged the gap. When we look at the, the four spiritual laws, it says that you must individually receive him for yourself. What that says is every tub must sit on its own bottom. Every tub must sit on its own bottom. In other words, just because you're related to the pastor, the deacon, the, the mother of the church, you still have to individually receive Jesus Christ for yourself. you got to be attached to that vine. I need to have an intimate relationship with God. Through this relationship, we're still talking about we're saved. We're still talking about this is eternal life. When we have eternal life, through this relationship, God reveals his will. What is his will? What God is about to do. Through this intimate relationship with God, God reveals to us his will. In other words, God uncovers. This word reveal means to uncover, to snatch the cover off, to let you see what's under there. God reveals his word. A lot of times people say the Bible is so confusing because it contradicts itself. Is that true? Does the Bible contradict itself? No. No? no. Well, why people say it does? Why well, it seems like to some people it does. Because they don't know about it. They haven't said it, so they think what they say. Okay, so the, the Bible, we've concluded that the Bible does not contradict itself. So we have to look at the content in the context. We have to look at the content and the context. And the Bible never contradicts itself because the Bible says one thing in this verse and a different thing in that verse, but it's all based on the content in the context. The guy decided one day he was going to open the Bible, he's going to study the Bible, he decided he's going to open the Bible, and wherever he opens up, that's where he's going to start reading. And he's going to obey the word of God. He's going to obey the word of God. He opened the Bible. The Bible, Bible says that your children will be off. He said, oh, no, that's not good. Your, 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 he said, the Bible says your children will be orphans, and your wife will be a widow. He said, no, that ain't what the Lord was leading me to do. So he turned again. He said, and, and, and then Judas went out and hung himself. He said, no, the Lord ain't speaking to me on that one either. Therefore, you cannot take the Bible out of content, and you know, and you can't use it when it's convenient to you. It's kind of like some people use prayer. I mean, it's a fire escape for them, baby. Right? It's an escape mechanism for them. It's something that they use when they're in trouble. If you only pray when you're in trouble, you 
I am strong. Thank God, I say that again. If you only pray when you are in trouble, you are in trouble. If your prayer time is only when you're trying to get out of trouble, you, you stay in trouble. Because if you only call on God when you need, you think you need him. And let me tell you, we need him every day, every second, every hour of the day. We need God. We got to stay intimately involved with God because God reveals to us what God is about to do. Have you ever known that God was going to do something and you didn't know what he was going to do it? But the moment you talked to him, he showed you what you were going to do? One guy, one guy bowed down on his knees. He needed a job. He needed a job badly. He bowed down on his knees and he was praying, Lord, I need this job. I put in the application in this place, this place, and this place. And while he was praying, he was bowed down, thanking God and asking God for a job, the best job, and the phone rang. Now, some of you would have kept on praying because, you know, you're holy now and somebody's interrupting your prayer. But as for me, I'm asking God for a job. The phone rings. I'm jumping up. I'm, close. I'm saying, Lord, thank you. Grab the phone because I'm expecting God to deliver and to reveal some things to me that I didn't know before I started praying. Many times our being super spiritual Make us miss our blessings. So, so we have to understand that God reveals himself. He reveals what he's going to do as we have this relationship, this constant fellowship with him. The revelation becomes an invitation to join him where he is at work. When God reveals himself, he not only reveals himself, he reveals where he's at work and what he's doing. And God is giving us an invitation to come and join God where he's at work. Stop wanting God to come join you where you at work. Or stop asking God to come sit down because you sit down. Stop asking God to join you when you're in the midst of doing nothing. There's a time for prayer and there's a time for participation. There's a time for prayer and there's a time for performance. We have to join God where God is at work. God has given us an invitation. We need to be asking God, God, reveal unto me where you at work. God, reveal unto me what are you doing. And God, since you are doing some things, I want to accept this invitation and join you where you at work. Do you know that God is at work all around us? God is at work and he's revealing things to us every single day. We are to join him where he is at work. You got to look for God. You got to look for God's work. You got to look what God is doing. God is at work. God is, is sending us an invitation to join him right where he is, where he is at work. When I obey God, the moment I obey God, and the one who God has sent, Jesus Christ, when I obey God, God accomplished through me something only God can do. When we walk in faith, we're asking God, God, I can't do this on my own. Matter of fact, we ought to say, God, I can't do this at all. There are several million of people who have jobs that they don't deserve. There are some people that lied on their resume and God had passion and compassion enough to give it to them anyway. You know how you used to fill out a resume? Do they still do resumes? Do they still do, they do online application and tell you to, to, to CCV your resume? So when you do a resume, you're supposed to put on the resume what you have done. 
And in, in on that resume, it ought to include how long you did it. But we know that people want to hire people who have had a consistent work history, right? Now, we've had 12 jobs in the last year. But it looks better when we say, I stayed on this one job five years. Oh, your resume is impeccable. Your resume looks good. And God has mercy. God gives us favor even when we lie on the resume. Now your pastor didn't say lie on your resume. I said people have jobs that lie on their resume. But God is at work and he gives us invitation to come and join him where we are. One of, one of, the, one of the things that some people do when they go, when, when Astro World was here and then they go to see World in San Antonio, what they would do is they got some rides that you have to be a certain height to ride on. And if you are a certain age, regardless of your height, you got to pay the adult fees. Sometimes it's 10 years old. And because your little boy looks like he's 10, and the man asks, how old is he? Oh, he's 10. It's amazing to me that all of them come through there are 10. Because when you're 10, you pay $6. When you're 10 or less, you pay $6. Your mom and dad will pay $6. When you're 11 and above, you may have to pay $12. Now here your parents come, sacrificing their relationship with God over $6. I mean, you got a pocket full of money, got tickets, got braces and everything. But they will sacrifice their relationship, their fellowship with God over six little dollars. And before they get back to the hotel, they have lost their whole wallet. Only if they had paid the six dollars and not lied about it. You gotta walk with God. Wherever God's at work, let God be at work and you walk with God. So he says, says to us that God accomplishes through us or through me something only God can do. There are some things in my life that I want done. I already know nobody can do it but God. I even know the people who have what I need, they're not going to give it to me unless the Lord touch their hearts. And boy, I'm praying God touch their hearts. God minister to them. Even if they are ranked sinners, even if they don't know you, Lord, use them. The wise writer says in Proverbs, Proverbs 13, 22, it says that the, the wealth of the unrighteous are laid up for the righteous. The goods of the unrighteous are laid up for the righteous. And that thing is true even before Jesus returns. It is true that if you walk with God, God can bless you. If you don't walk with him, he can't bless you. You have to develop a love and intimate relationship with God. I will only experience life to its fullest measure if I'm willing to accept God's invitation to an intimate relationship with him. I will never live to my fullest until I accept God's invitation to an intimate love relationship with God. I can only make it to the fullest. I mean, when Jesus talks about that God wants to bless us abundantly, he wants our lives to, to, to reflect abundant blessing bless us abundantly, we can never be blessed to the full unless we depend on God, unless we trust him. We will never experience a full measure until we willingly accept the invitation that God is asking us to accept. And that invitation is to walk with him. That invitation is to join him in an intimate relationship with him. How do we get in this intimate relationship? We got to spend time with God. We got to get to know you. Your loved ones, 
you know them well because you spent time with them. And I'm going to tell you something. FaceTime won't do it. You got to spend intimate time in the presence of God. You have to spend intimate time in a love relationship with God. As we walk with him, as we depend on him, as we lead others to him, as we are devoted to him, then God can bless us a whole heap of pain. We got to trust God. Got to depend on Him. Hear me back. Hear me back. We said it like this. I must, we must, you must. First, trust Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and submit to him as your Lord. You must first be born again. You can't accept God's invitation to join him if you have not accepted Jesus Christ and he has become your Savior. You got to accept Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior in order to join God and join him through his invitation. Children used to come over to the house all the time, especially athletes. When we went home, they would come over to the house. And it, it looked like during football season when my brother would bring all the linemen in that protected him. He would bring all, all the linemen that like they had to come to the quarterback's house. So my brother would walk in the door and about 12 people behind him. And they would, they would come through the door and the first thing they see is the sink here and the stove there. They weren't concerned about a sink. They went to the stove and mama had to tell them to wash their hands. They went to the stove and act like it was their house. And all of them between 210 pounds and 285 pounds. And they act like they hadn't eaten all week long. But the only way they could get in the house was because my brother brought them in the house. So because my brother had a relationship with my parents, then the, the linemen would come in and eat too. And whenever my brother or or one of us would talk bad about the line of eating with my dad and said, leave them boys alone, let them eat all they want to eat. We would remind them, you're not at your house. Food has to be here when you're gone. Mom and dad would say, leave them alone. Let them eat. We have to have a relationship with God in order to live to our fullness. We have to trust Jesus as our personal Savior. And the only way those boys could actually get in the house is because my brother was with them. They could only eat mama's food because my brother was with them. And here it is today. They are full grown men in their 50s and they still, Miss Rosie, you got something to eat in there? I mean, man, you don't live here anymore. As a matter of fact, you ain't even in school anymore. But it takes us having a relationship with the Son in order to get to the Father. Right. We must be born again. We must know Jesus as our Savior. Who has John 10.10? 10? John 10.10. 10. John chapter 10, verse 10. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. Amen. Thank you. So Jesus says the thief is real. <laughs> the devil is not some guy with two forks on his head walking around with red neotards with a pointed tail with a pitchfork. That's not how the devil is dressing today. The devil does not walk around wagging his tail and talking to us. The devil has assumed bodies. He has invaded bodies. The devil has become a parasite. And he goes around walking with people who are not of God. 
He, he infiltrates the heart of the unbeliever, but he influences the heart of the believer. He's the devil, Lucifer, Satan himself. God stopped him one day. Say, hey, where you been? The devil says, I've been walking to and fro throughout the whole earth trying to find somebody I can devour. And then God said, I don't know if you considered my servant Job. Have you considered my servant Job? He's a righteous man. And even the devil says, I can't touch him. You got a hedge of protection around him. The devil comes, but they steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus says, I have come that you might have life and have life more abundant. Jesus has come that your life will be to the full. Jesus has come because you don't have to ride on fumes anymore. You can be full. Jesus has come for you. Any questions or comments? Any questions or comments? Therefore, we see there's a prerequisite, right? On page number eight, we find this prerequisite as a prerequisite. I can accept Jesus Christ as my Savior through the book of Romans. Then it's called what? What is this called? The book of Romans for salvation. The Romans road, the Romans road right? Why is it called the Romans road? It's the way to get to God. It's the road to get to God. It's the road to get to God. Why is it called the Romans road? The road to get to God. Why is it called the Romans road? Because it's in the book of Romans. Because all the steps are in the book of Romans. And if you look at the business card that I passed out on the back side of that business card, it's the Romans road. And this is what it looks like. Romans 3, 23, all have sinned, all have fallen short of God's glory. How many? All. How many is all? Everybody. Everybody. Romans 3 and 23, we need a savior because we all have sinned. But no, you know, when we get in church for a little while, we say y'all have sinned. We don't say it with our mouth, but we look down our nose at people and we call out their sin. You can't look down your nose at other people because your sin is different. The Romans road says, Romans 3.23 declares that we all have sinned. We all have fallen short. We all have missed the mark. We all have missed the target. We all have sinned. Adam made sure of that. And don't get down on Adam because we make sure of it every day. We all have sin. Romans 6, 23 says, eternal life is a free gift of God. Romans 6, 23 says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is life, a free gift, and this free gift comes from God. Romans 6, 23 declares that Everybody who have sinned, and Romans 3.23 says we all have, right? So Romans 6.23 says there's a payment for sin. Everything we do has a payback. Everything Adam has done has a payback. There's a pay for sin. The payment is eternal death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. It is a free gift from God. Romans 5 and 8. Romans 5 and 8 says, because God loves us. Because God loves us dearly. Jesus paid the death penalty for our sins. Romans 5 and 8 says, while we were yet in our sins, Christ died for us. God loved us so much until Christ died for us. He gave his only begotten son. Jesus Christ paid for our sin. He paid for the death penalty of our sins. Amen. Confess and repent your sins against the Holy God. What he's saying is, Romans 5 and 8, we need to understand that Jesus paid the cost. Amen. He paid the ransom. 
He paid a cost that we could not pay. He paid for it. Jesus Christ paid for our sins. How did he pay for it? Through his death on the cross. That's why we have to go back. If you're going to heaven, you got to go back out. If you're going to make it to heaven, you need to understand that Good Friday was real. And as a boy, I wonder why they call it Good Friday when such a mean thing happened, such a bad thing happened on Good Friday. They killed an innocent man. There was a man on the right that was a sinner. There was a man on the left that was a sinner. But the man in the middle had no sin. They killed him on Good Friday. But we like to rejoice on Easter Sunday morning. We like to rejoice on Resurrection Sunday. But you can't have Resurrection Sunday without an awful thing that took place on Good Friday. Right. Romans 8, Romans 5 and 8 declares that that God demonstrated his love toward us. And when, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He paid the price. Romans 10, 9 through 10 declares that we must confess Jesus as our Lord and believe that God has raised him from the dead. We will be saved. We will be saved. That, King James says it like this, that if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, that God has raised Jesus from the dead, thou shalt be saved. You will be saved. Then you have Romans 10, 13. Ask God to save you and he will. He that calls upon the Lord shall be saved. Ask God to save you, he will. If I'm going to receive the free gift of eternal life, I must place my faith in Jesus alone. It's not Jesus in what we can do. It's not Jesus in something else. It is Jesus alone. We must place our faith in Jesus alone. This is done by recognizing that I am a sinner who needs a saving relationship with Jesus the Christ. I'm a sinner who needs a relationship with the Savior himself. Jesus of Christ. Confessing, agreeing with God. We're going to agree with God about our sins. Lord, I agree with you. I am wrong and you are right. Lord, I agree with you. I acknowledge that I am wrong and you are right. Repenting of my sins means to turn from our sins and turn to God. Turn from our sin and turn to God. Say no to sin and yes to God. The problem with the with the 80s and the, the 70s, the 80s, and the early 90s, they said, say no to drugs. Just say no to drugs. But they didn't give you anything to say yes to. I'm saying to you, say no to your sin, but say yes to God. Say no to your sins and say yes to God. Asking Jesus to save you or save me by his grace. Lord, I need you to save me and I know your grace is not something I deserve. Lord, I'm asking you to save me. Turning over the rule of my life to Jesus and letting him be my Lord. You know, we oftentimes say it like this. Jesus is my Lord and my Savior. But really, Jesus is my Savior, and then he becomes my Lord. What's the difference? He's my Savior. Why did he have to be my Savior first? Somebody, somebody else. Why did he have to be my Savior, then he becomes my Lord? Who's talking? Why did he have to be my Savior first? Am I right? Does he have to be my Savior? Yes. Why does he have to be my Savior, and then become my Lord? Because when he saves us, it's only then that we belong to him. Okay, so he saves us, he gives us a relationship, we belong to him. So what happens when he becomes my Lord? What's that? What's that all about? He's now my Lord. Not only is he my Savior, he's my Lord. You allow him to sit on the throne of your heart. 
and do what he's telling us. I'm going to sit on the throne of my heart. Meaning we do what he says to do, right? We're obedient to him. He leads us. He guides us. We submit to him. And when we submit to him, then and only then is he our Lord. There may be somebody tonight that needs Jesus to be their Lord. There may be somebody tonight that needs Jesus as your Savior. The door of the church is open. The invitation is extended. This is your moment. You can know Jesus as your Savior. And you can submit to him as your Lord. You can have a right relationship with him as your Savior. And then you can have good and wholesome fellowship with him as your Lord. If you never received Jesus as your Savior, bow your head with me and repeat this simple prayer of inviting Jesus into your life. Just say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you rose from the dead. Lord, I believe that me men killed you, they laid you in a tomb, and you rose from the dead. Lord, come into my life and make me a new person. Thank you for saving my soul. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We believe if you honestly pray this prayer, believing that Jesus is the Son of God, that he died for your sins and rose from the dead. We believe that you're born again, you're saved. And we believe that if you just trust Jesus, then he can make you fruitful. Thank you for joining us here in Bible study. Thank you for joining us in the first chapter, the first day of experiencing God. You want to study your book, chapters one and two, that means days one and two. So we can pick up where we, we left off on today. Days one and two. We'll pick up where we left off on today. Are there any praise report or prayer requests? Praise reports. Our prayer requests. Any praise reports or prayer requests. Please write down this note. Uh, we will begin our fast, our 21 day fast on March 10, March 10, and we will end it on March 30th. March 10 is our, our, our prayer and fasting. Our prayer and fasting will begin on March 10 and it will end on March 30th. Let me make sure that, that Johnny Taylor knows that it's not a full fast. <laughs> he was getting ready to get up and walk out of here. <laughs> or run out of here. This fast is from, from pork, from beef, from sweets, from soda, and fried food. No fried food for 21 days. No pork, no beef for 21 days. No sweets for 21 days, other than maybe a breast milk or so. And no sodas. 21 days. Starting March 10th through March 30th. That will be our, our brand ambassador time. I do have a praise report. Our youth and our young people met for, for our, our movie night. And for their mission trip, they were able to, in one night, they were able to to gain $835, $835 for our mission trip. So we're about 15% away, away from, we're about 15% into our goal. Our goal is $40,000 and our bus has been reserved and we, we have to go down the road now. So uh, if you want to donate, please feel free to donate to our youth and our young people. Some of them have four, four to five people in the family, and it's eight hundred dollars per person per adult, eight hundred dollars per child. So please, ma'am, please, sir, help them in their domestic mission opportunities. We're looking forward to a great time in the Lord. We have three church services lined up: two 
English servers and one Spanish servers lined up in Mississippi and Tennessee. Uh, we will be working in the field there. They'll get a chance to get their hands dirty, helping other people in missions. And then we're going to visit the hospital there where, uh, similar to the, the Texas Children Hospital, where we'll be ministering to children. So please, ma'am, please, sir, if you want to go, there's still room for you to go. It is $800 per person. Amen. Are there any praise report or prayer requests? Any praise report or prayer requests? March 10th, March 10th is, is our church anniversary. 31 years of worshiping the same Lord. 31 years is our church anniversary. The morning service will be True Vision, True Vision Church. Pastor Lionel Aaron will be here, and his church will be here for the 10.30 service. And then the evening service, the afternoon service at 3 p.m. will be the Holy Street Church of Third Ward, Houston, Texas. Pastor Murray G. Martin will be joining us on that day. Amen. Please, ma'am, please, sir, uh, let's turn our hearts toward giving. It is often time, it's time to give to the Lord through tithes, offering, and sacrificial gifts. If you want to give electronically, you can do so by giving by way of Zelle. Our Zelle account is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting. God, Jesus at Yahoo.com is our Zell account. And our, our uh, P.O. Box is P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. You want to humble look, please raise your hand and you will be served. Please raise your hand way up in the air and you will be served. Please raise your hand. Father God, we thank you for these gifts. We ask you to bless us as we go. In Jesus' name, amen. Why don't we stand and be dismissed? Father God, we thank you now, Lord. We bless your name. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your grace. We thank you, Father God, for another privilege to join you when you are at work. We ask you to bless us to experience God like never before. Bless us to experience him in a very deep and intimate way. Bless us, Father God, that our hearts will be turned toward you, that we, Father God, will always look to you, the author and the finisher of our faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and thank God. Those of you who do not have a book, please follow me to the office so I can give you the notes for next week. And those of you who do have a book, please read ahead so you can participate on next week. Amen. God bless you and keep you. Thank God.